Well, church website trends, they change all the time, and we're going to unpack in this conversation the 11 biggest trends that we're seeing in church websites right now. Let's do this. Well, hey guys, I'm Thomas. And I'm Ian. And today we are talking about 11 church website trends that you need to know for 2024. I think it'll be an important conversation. That is our uh, bread and butter, I guess here you would say. Although it's not the primary thing we do here at Retried anymore. Yeah. We started out doing church websites and it is still yeah. very much a part of our DNA yeah. and what we do all the time for lots yeah. of clients. And so with that, we have our finger pretty well on the trends and what's working yeah. and what isn't working anymore for church websites. Uh, yep. So I think it should be good for us to dive into some of these. Thoughts, Ian? Yeah, you, yeah, you and I have, of course, of course uh, dealt with church websites before church churches even knew they needed a website. So what, yeah. for almost over 15 years now? So we've most certainly seen the trends change. Uh, say over, over 15 last... years, buddy. It's it's like closer to 18 years now, I think. Well, there I think, you go. Yeah, I'm just been trying long... to not, not make us sound that old. So anyway, we've seen, uh, we've definitely seen trends change over the years and have built websites uh, for a long time. And a lot has changed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it sure has. It's been a totally, totally different world now. So um, in fact, we'll start off with the first one. This was one in our 18 years of doing this that didn't even exist yeah. then. It's mobile optimization. The idea yeah. 18 years ago that you'd have to optimize a website for mobile devices was insane. Uh, but now yeah. with the vast majority of traffic that your church is experiencing, most people are getting onto your site, not on the desktop computer, uh, but yeah. on a mobile device. And so therefore it it needs to be mobile optimized. Yeah. Uh, and by that, I, I would even say it needs to be mobile first. Uh, so here's the issue is that so many of us, when we design and create content for our websites, that still is primarily done on a desktop or a laptop computer. Uh, and the issue with that is that that's where we check it. We we take a look, hey, did this content look good? Or did we? Did, is yeah. this graphic looking right? Uh, yes, it is. We look at it on our same desktop. But then we need to realize that almost everybody else is going to see it on their phone or on a tablet or on some other kind of device. And so yeah. we need to make sure that we're actually designing it so that first and foremost, it's a good experience on those devices, uh, not a first and foremost on a desktop or laptop device. Right. So uh, right. I can't overstate how important this is. Uh, your mobile look and feel of your site is uh, only growing its importance. So make sure you're mobile yeah. optimized. Yeah, that's a, a, a no brainer and thing number one for these days. So do um, you remember when it used to be that you had to actually design a separate website for mm -hmm. mobile? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, again, we've seen a lot change with it. So and not one more thing I'll add with this. You don't leave desktops and laptops in the dust. Your website will still look good on those. It's just you got to have it optimized for for mobile. So we're not right. saying you don't look good on it. People will still use desktops and laptops. So next one also that's been tried and true since we've uh, seen the origination of church websites, Thomas, is to have interactive elements uh, on your website, interactive elements, have it interactive, your website. So uh, obviously calendar, uh, a, ca a church calendar is still something that people will interact with. Sermons on your website, still obviously a given uh, you know, where they can give online. And I think what we've really seen as far as uh, in recent years, the interactive uh, portions, other than what we just mentioned, are just ways for people to respond. Good websites now yeah. have compelling content in a way, whether or not it's a form that someone fills out, some way for someone to respond and for you to engage them. Uh, ahead of time, so. Yeah, it has to be more than an online brochure. Um, your website, yeah. if, it, if that's all that it is, you're missing an enormous opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think just interactivity. I think even in like your content that you're creating, every time you create a piece of content, what we tell people to do is ask yourself this question, what do I want someone to do as a result yeah. of being on this page or in this section yeah. or watching this sermon? You wanna make sure that's abundantly clear and that's a chance for interactivity. Uh, so yeah. asking people to comment or you know filling out a form if they wanna check out your church for the first time or just having some yeah. way to make it a two-way street, it makes a, you know, and this is how it works nowadays. And this is the, yeah. the one of the best ways to get results on your church website. Yeah. So, exactly. all right, next one, obvious is modern design and aesthetic. 
Uh, we are seeing a trend more and more towards simplicity. Um, yeah. I think that the days of busy websites and even yeah. lots of movement and things on your sites, mm -hmm. we're seeing, I think there's a place for movement on a site and we still are huge fans of background videos and these kinds yeah. of things. But I think just simplicity is winning the day. And you yeah. see this across the board from even the biggest brands, uh, busy, loud websites with lots of things to grab your attention. Yeah. Uh, are not the right way. The right design aesthetic in most cases is one clear next step and everything yep. driving someone towards that. So That's yeah, right. being modern with that, I think really making sure you nail your photography in those pieces That's, in your design, yeah. I think that really goes a long way too. That's what I was going to say. Photography and videography really drives the look of a website compared to years past where it was colors and fonts. And those things are still important too. You want to have a well-branded website, of course. Yes. But yeah, it's simplicity, photos, video that, that drive the look of it. So do a very good job of, of course, those things there. So um, good. Next one is accessibility features. This is one that might be overlooked. Um, you want to make sure that uh, that you that everyone can, dis despite whatever impairment they may have, um, you know, be able to access and utilize your, your website uh, uh, clearly. So these are things like, alt text for images, uh, keyboard navigation options for people that don't uh, have a mouse, um, you know, adjustable font sizes for people with visual impairments, mm -hmm. um, you know, transcripts for audio content, uh, so for people with hearing impairments, and then captions for videos as well. So those things are definitely important. You want obviously to, to, to serve anyone well, despite what their, uh, their limitations may be from, from your website. Yeah. A couple of things I'd say about this. Um, so if you've had a organization with a website for any length of time, you've probably got emails. I get these. I got these uh, in churches that I've led. I get these at ReachWrite all the time where uh, it's almost like a scare tactic that people will use to tell you that like, hey, you need to make sure your website is yeah. accessible to uh, to people of all abilities. Uh, yeah. And they'd warn you about some legislation that's out there uh, where you're going to get fined thousands of dollars if you're not compliant with this. Um, and I, I don't, we give no legal advice here. So don't take this as legal advice. Some of that probably is true. I have heard exactly zero accounts of churches yeah. ever being sued or anything yeah. for having an inaccessible website. But again, yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't do it for that reason. I do it because you actually want to help people of all abilities. Yeah. And I will say as a little bonus is that you actually will see search improvement if you get these things right. Uh, so if you get your alt text right and you're, you have a, one of the big things I see churches do a lot is they'll maybe make an image for an event, let's say. Let's say um, Easter is coming up and yeah. you have your big Easter image that's on the site. Uh, and with that, that's where you have all the details of your Easter service. So it says, you know, Sunday at nine o'clock and Easter egg hunt to follow, but it's in the actual image and not in the actual text of your website. Yeah. Well, unless you put in alt text and things to mitigate this, a screen reader isn't going to see all of the text in the image, and therefore it won't be able to tell someone yeah. who is uh, who uh, is seeing impaired that what this actually says here. Uh, so yeah. you need yeah. to make sure you're thinking about that. And it's also like remember that basically. Google with its SEO algorithm, it sees the same things that screen readers see. Yeah. Uh, so if your website is almost all imagery, which is great having images on your site, but if that's the primary driver, you just have to remember that that is not the most search friendly and yeah. uh, screen readers, uh, they work the same way for Google's SEO algorithm as well. So yeah. something to keep in mind with that. Yeah, that's good. All right, next one is a personalized user experience. I'm reading more and more about this. This is something that um, at, a, at a grand level isn't for every church. Um, right. I've seen some churches that have all kinds of different, uh, we'll call them segments of users. Uh, yeah. So um, it will have, this, basically what it is, is the site will have some kind of a memory. Uh, and if you're a 54-year-old uh, man uh, yeah. who is a member of the church and is married with kids, it'll show you different experiences based on all of those kinds yeah. of criteria. 
and so this is something that is certainly possible uh, on websites now. Uh, and yeah. you better believe that some of the largest companies are using this. They oh, know yeah. what your interests are and they know the things that you've looked at before and they're gonna, sh they're gonna show you products based on your past purchases and yeah. things you may be shopping for. Um, I would say for the vast majority of churches, that's way over the bar of something that you'd be able to execute. And uh, these are, you know, hundred thousand dollar plus kinds of projects uh, to yeah. make sure you tailor it so that a you know 54 year old man is only seeing uh, you know men's breakfast and certain things right. to invite their kids to uh, and you know a, a very tailored experience and not yeah. seeing other stuff so something to consider and maybe play with and if you're on the cutting edge look into a little bit what I yeah. would say where this applies to most churches is making sure you have personalized experiences for your two main buckets and that is people that are a part of your church and people that are not yet a part of your church. That's right. Uh, so yeah. I say most churches, they probably err on the side of making it a little bit too internal. Uh, yes. So it's, you know, what would a member want to see? What are they looking right. for? Because they're the ones that are giving you feedback on your site. And so you tend to cater to them. And yeah. part of our job here at Retrite is really pushing churches to think more visitor-minded. What does a visitor want to see? What are they expecting? And really thinking through what your experience would be like for a visitor and giving them really clear next steps. If you have no familiarity with our church at all, like really helping tailor that experience for someone when they're on the site. Yeah, no, that's good. Another thing too is, uh, you know, and that makes me think of I'm new pages or plan your visit pages. That's totally tailored on the visitor of course, your events and sermons and giving, those are more membership tools uh, as well. And then uh, and then one other little page that's very common now and effective is a next steps page. Mm -hmm. That's also for the person that is newer, not like brand yeah. new, but newer and looking to get a little bit deeper into the involvement of your church, whether or not it's serving, getting baptized, you know, joining a small group. So uh, that this is a way to segment things a little more. That's the tool to pages. The tool to move them from bucket A to bucket right. B, right? So they're going that's from it. not yet a part to a part, uh, and that's yeah. the tool to help them bridge that gap there. And yeah, yep. super, kind super of that important middle tool. Yeah. Next one is social media integration. This used to be a little different. You know, we talk about our past and what we've seen on church websites. It used to be that you would want to pull in every post from Facebook or every tweet into your website and. You could still maybe do that, but honestly, now it's more of just making things shareable, like messages, like your mm -hmm. sermons, you know, someone able to share that easily on their Facebook or feed or wherever they want to send it to uh, for social media. Um, and, you know, now too, it, it's one of those things, if someone goes to your website, you really do want to keep them there. So mm -hmm. usually you do want for them to be able to link out to start following you on social media. That's kind of expected in the footer as someone thumbs down from a smartphone to get down there. And maybe if they're after they've seen what they want on the website to go check out what you're doing on social media. But we're in this day and age where people, if, if they're going to try to find you on social media, they're going to know how to do that on their own. You don't necessarily need to rely on your website for that, but there does still need to be integration there for sure. Um, and another thing for SEO, which is what we talk about, so for you to rank well with Google and be visible, is to not always send everyone out of your website for content, yes. but keep them there. So you do want to kind of, you know, uh, exercise caution when it comes to how much social media integration you have these days. Yeah. So in social media's earlier years, I'm thinking about Facebook and some of the earlier yeah. years of Facebook, uh, it used to be that you could share links on Facebook, and if you shared a link, you could drive a lot of traffic to your website. Yeah. Uh, that is almost completely dried up because all of the social media giants, they've realized that our income comes from people staying on Facebook or TikTok yep. or whatever platform they're on. That's where it comes from for us. So we're going to make sure that we don't send traffic off of Facebook onto someone yep. else's site. And the same thing should go for you is that yep. it, you should realize that while it's not income we're concerned with, but we're able to change hearts and minds and souls when they're on our website better than any other place on the internet. Yep. Uh, so if it used to be that churches would try to get lots of content or like you'd have those, you know, find us on Facebook links up in the top navigation. Terrible yeah. idea now. You yeah. want to relegate those to the footer. One little tip I would say is 
even with those buttons that are there for whether it be X, Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram, or YouTube, I would make sure that those open in a new window and don't just mm. take someone off of your site. Because once they've left your site, the odds of them coming back or hitting the back Correct. button are pretty slim. But if they're opening it in a new window, it kind of keeps that session alive and helps you to continue to engage with them there. So yeah, yeah I think well said, Ian. Um, it's about integrating and giving people the chance to share your content yeah. on social media. I think that's really where this shines the most. That's it. All right, next one is security and privacy. Um, I don't know if this is really an outreach trend, but it is something to be serious about. Um, yeah. We actually had a few of our sites even today uh, that we're dealing with that have had some challenges with security because uh, best we can tell, people were using a password that was probably like Jesus123 or something like that as their <laughs> password onto yeah. the site. And so uh, that's just never a good idea. You never want right. to uh, be doing that. So um, I don't know. There, let me just give this as a reminder. If you're sitting here watching this podcast or listening to this podcast and you're thinking, oh, that's exactly what my password is. It's Jesus123. <laughs> Seven seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or seven seven seven, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's probably time to get in and change that and use yeah. a strong password. Uh, most browsers like Chrome now, they have a really great password manager. It'll recommend it for you. Use the one they recommend. Those are almost impossible to crack. So get serious about those kinds of things. Um, again, not really an outreach tool, uh, but it is something that'll save you a lot of heartache in the future if you're using weak passwords on things. So take your security yeah. seriously. It's good. Next one, this should definitely be uh, a no-brainer too these days, uh, is to have online, gave, online giving yes. easily accessible. So online giving, I rarely come across, although I do at times, a church that does not offer online giving. Even bad church websites that I see typically have somewhere where someone can give. But the key word I think with this is easy. Now, we don't recommend you make it the main focus of your website and be obnoxious and you know, have people <laughs> uh, have their stigmas confirmed that this church is just after my money and that's all they want. We don't want to, uh, to cater to that mindset, but make it easy for them to give. Make sure that you're integrated. You have a good giving system that you're integrating into a good giving page that's mm -hmm. easily accessible in your navigation. And you want to make sure that you don't make it hard for people to give, uh, you know, on your church's website as they're, as they're compelled to do so. Good advice. Don't make it hard for people to give. That's something you no. want to make it uh, remove any barriers. Um, yeah. I I will say this. So one of the things that I see, um, we've done a whole uh, episode or a, a whole conversation on this uh, yeah. about asking visitors if they want to cover your donor fees. Yeah. Uh, and we did some research. We dug in fees. pretty deep yeah. on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. The transaction fees, because yeah. on average, it's going to be about three, two to three percent, uh, depending right. on the card and the provider and those kinds yeah. of things. Uh, yeah. And so, um, two to three percent is a small amount in theory, but we all know that it adds up. If you're giving, yeah. you know, a thousand dollars a month to your church, well, yeah. that's thirty dollars every single time someone gives amongst your whole yeah. church. Um, that's a big chunk. Yep. However, I think what happens is a lot of times churches will be tempted to say, okay, well, if we ask someone if they want to cover the fees to help us, you know, absolve us of some of that cost, that makes a lot of sense. But there's a lot of research out there that shows that that actually is going to cost you more because when we ask people to cover the fees, uh, it kind of it kind of takes their focus off the real reason why they're giving right. and puts it on to yeah. all this transactional stuff and it just doesn't make yeah. it feel right. So we yeah. came to the conclusion kind of take, that... Could take the worship out of it a little bit. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. we came to the conclusion that in most cases, it's probably better not to ask something like that. And so I think that it makes sense to... like Part of keeping it easy is just making it something that's seamless and people don't have to worry about your administrative costs when they're making yeah. a donation there. So... That's the bottom line. Uh, if you want to take a look at that video and see some of the research that we found there, uh, we'll link that to that down in the description. Or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, we'll put it in a, a, a note or a card up here on the top. You can check that out later. So yeah. uh, next one uh, is SEO optimization. Uh, this is really some of our bread and butter here. Uh, yeah. For churches, the primary kind of SEO optimization you want to focus on is local SEO. Uh, so 
It's for people that are searching for things like churches in my city or churches yep. near me, near those me. kinds of yeah. searches. You want to make sure that you come up in the Google map pack when people do those kinds of searches there. So the way that you do that, yeah. um, one of the things you can do on your site uh, is that you can make sure that your name, address, and phone number is always identical everywhere that you write it on your site, that you have it in your footer would be the best place for that. So it's really clear where you're located and there's no confusion on that. And that that matches what every directory online says about your church. Uh, so places like obviously your Google business profile, um, yeah. Apple Maps, Yelp, um, you know, all of the main mapping and directory, uh, yellow pages, that kind of stuff, all those different sites out there, you want to make sure they have your church in the, written in the same way on every one of those. Yeah. So yep. one of the big things we see is that if you're First Baptist Church, if uh, yeah. one place it says FBC uh, and other place it says First Baptist Church, another place it says... Uh, you know, uh, first Nantucket or whatever it would be, yeah, yeah. if it's written in different ways, Google will start to think, oh, this is a different organization that just happens to meet at the same place. And yeah. therefore they won't rank you as highly as you should be on that local map yeah. pack there. So that's an easy thing that you can do. Lots of other things involved with it, like getting yeah. more reviews and other things like that. We won't yeah. get too deep into it. We've done tons of content about local SEO. You can check that out. We'll leave some of those yeah. links in the description as well. And we just helped out uh, First Baptist Church in Nantucket. Good job, Tana. Thomas. <laughs> we did. Yeah, get on there. I'm sure there is one there. There's a First Baptist in every city. So I will add one more thing to this. We did see um, some good data from uh, Search Engine Journal, a really cool little graph that, uh, that I wanted to just read off. This was which digital marketing channel has the highest return on your investment uh, uh, for your church website. 18% was social media, 14% was email, 19% was paid search, and 49%, almost half, is organic search, which is what we're wow. talking about for SEO. So that's a big, there's a big difference between all those percentages. So um, if for those out there that like statistical data, again, uh, compared to all these other uh, digital marketing channels, organic search, about 50%. So good stuff. Good. Next one is... AI integration, big topic now, right? So um, AI, of course, is all the buzz, and and uh, we've we've talked about it at length uh, during different podcasts, different posts we've put out. But what does this mean for your website, Thomas? So what is what is AI specifically for a church's website? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, there's lots of things that are um, you can be using AI for when it comes to advertising, marketing, church websites, those things. I think that the, you know, obviously for content generation, it can be a good tool to use. Um, we say this every time we talk about AI, do not use AI to write entire sermons. It's a, per a terrible idea. I'm sure there's people that have done it out there. It doesn't work. It's not good. Uh, so don't make that, ha don't do that. But I think that there are tools for creating content on your website. You can use AI. So let's say that you want to do a blog post, maybe, um, you know, it's uh, maybe you're coming into Mother's Day, let's say, uh, and you want to think of uh, different ideas to give to, to families in your church to honor mob, and you want to make a blog yeah. post about that. AI is a great way to kind of give you a hit list of some of those ideas that you can then flesh out in your content and, you know, actually write the content for it and give it a spin for your church. So lots of things around AI and content. Uh, I think when it comes to actual integration on the front end of your website, I am just starting to see a few churches play with some AI like chat bots on their church website. Um, I don't think this is ready yet. Um, I think this is a pretty big risk that people are going to get bad theological advice if they're oh, no. typing into a chat bot. And you don't want like yeah. to, I, I can't see it working for a prayer chat bot or you need prayer, put yeah. it in here and then a, a AI prays for them or something like that. Yeah. that don't do that. That's just, that's creepy. Uh, you know, maybe we'll eat our words someday and someone can have yeah. some kind of a, a, the, a theological response to that, but that's the just Lord a bad will idea. start doing miracles, uh, answered <laughs> prayers through uh, AI. Yeah, we'll see. AI prayer bot. Yeah, no, don't do that. But I, I do think that there is some place to maybe field initial requests with AI at this point. And, and this is all something that it, it is coming, this kind of AI revolution. Like I was just reading, and I, I, it escapes me 
what company it was. I want to say it was Stripe or some other credit card processing company. Uh, they released some of their numbers where they replaced half of their support staff uh, that does chat support with AI bots. And then you know how big companies, they'll do like a survey after every single one of those chats to see how well your yeah. problem was answered, how quickly it happened. And the AI actually solved people's problems in the chat system faster and with a higher satisfaction rate than real customers on there. Uh, wow. So than real people, real yeah. customer support customer representatives. So, representatives. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Uh, there's a place for this. It's coming. I don't know if churches are ready for it yet, yeah. uh, but it's something that it might be fun to kind of play with. And maybe yeah. there's a place to field initial requests, but I think we're still at a place where a human has to get involved with it. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Cool. Last but not least... Yeah, go for it. Improvement and adaptation. So again, I think here just uh, taking the technical mumbo jumbo out of it, just keeping content fresh, regularly updating your website. If you don't already have analytics tied to your church's website, you're really missing out because if you're investing in a good church website, you want to know and monitor the results. We recommend Google Analytics. They're probably still the best at it, we believe. Uh, out there and uh, so get that set up obviously we've already talked about mobile optimization staying up with trends testing your site making sure it's optimized making sure that you're always looking at the content on, on your website is that content strategic to reach first-time visitors or is it out of date these yeah. things we think are obvious if you're if you're uh, managing a website and keeping it fresh yeah, here at Retrite, we measure everything. Like so, yeah. when it comes to our website, especially, we we have uh, you know the you know, we have dashboards that you know oh, yeah. you and I and the rest of our team look at, and we uh, we gauge how we're doing. Um, not not spiritually, but <laughs> we gauge how we're doing like performance wise based on numbers. And this is something that's yeah. so important that you do this on a church level as well. Um, I think you're going to find all kinds of things if you start measuring it on your website. Um, if you're, you'll, you'll notice that there's certain places where people get off of your website and our uh, first time visitor forms or our, our plan your visit forms are mostly coming to us from this particular page. Yeah. Uh, one tool above Google Analytics that I would recommend is using Google Search Console. Uh, ah. This is, it's a tool that you can set up on your website and uh, if you have a web developer, um, they can probably help you get that installed there pretty simply. If not, we'd love to be your web developer, so drop us a line yeah. in the comments or you could fill out a form on our site. Uh, but um, use Google Search Console. It's actually information that's more search oriented. So it says what terms people are searching for that they wind up going to your site uh, looking at. Uh, so, um, you know, and what pages on your site are they landing on most often? And so yeah. you can do so much with that information. And what it helps you do is say, well, a lot of our traffic is coming from people looking for this. It'll always help you think of new ideas of how you can make more content like that and get more traffic onto your site. And that'll lead to more people visiting your church and uh, really good opportunities for people there. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. Improvement and adaptation, it's a constant battle. This is something that in the website industry we wrestle with yeah. because people feel like, you know, kind of that sprint of getting your website launched yeah. is all the work. But yep. that really is, it's it's the hardest work for sure. Right. But it's really only the beginning because yep. this has to be something that evolves with you. Um, and it really does snowball if you start to take this yep. stuff seriously. So that's some good advice, Ian. That's good. That's good. That's awesome. Anything else to say as we wrap up? No, we know that this there was 11 of these, so quite a bit of information, but we hope it was helpful. And at least maybe you discovered that two of these things you weren't doing at all or anything. We love that. And we'd love to hear other things. Maybe maybe something that we missed, right? We'd love yeah. to hear from folks about that, Thomas. Yeah. yeah, drop us a comment down below. And if there's something that you're seeing that's getting you results uh, right now that wasn't maybe before or something new you're trying, uh, I'd love to hear about it. So drop us a comment down below. Uh, hit that subscribe button for us as well. That's how we get the word out there about the Reach Right podcast and what we're doing yeah. here. Thanks, guys, for being a part of the Reach Right family. And we'll see you next time. See you.